Uh, you may be wondering with the title why I've prioritised dung beetles. And dung beetles has really been an entree into livestock um, consumption of biochar. So we'll start with a little bit of context building. I'm from Manjimup in the southwest of Western Australia. It's approximately 300 kilometres from the, um, the city of Perth. We, I'm representing Warren Catchments Council, which is a community governed, not-for-profit, natural resource management organisation, which is a bit of a mouthful. We've short, shortened the name in Australia to Land Care. So we're essentially concerned with conserving biodiversity um, through feral animal control, weed control, that type of thing. Um, but we also have a sustainable agriculture wing, which is where my interests particularly lie. Our area is based on a number of catchments and uh, it, it covers approximately 10,000 square kilometres. So we have a range of land use uh, applications throughout. <coughs> Tim Planner has already cracked a mention today, so I shall do a quick repeat here. 2007 was a fairly pivotal moment for biochar and Australia because it was coinciding with the time of, of a newly elected government which believed in climate change and initiated uh, a whole stack of measures to do something about it, including a carbon market. So biochar as a carbon sequestration mechanism became an actual reality. It also coincided a time where our area, which um, the Shire of Manjimup itself is approximately 85% forest. So as has been described here earlier, there are significant biomass opportunities there, um, especially when the timber industry was undergoing significant downturn. There were restrictions on um, the use of native timbers, um, management investment streams, uh, schemes entered into the plantation industry and the bottom fell out of the timber uh, industry altogether. So a way to be able to utilise that biomass and earn carbon credits was a really attractive proposition. Now as a facilitator of um, workshops, presentations, etc., we invited whoever we could get to present information about biochar to our community. At that time, the greatest interest was among sawmillers um, and farmers who were looking at the possibility of capitalising on it. The first speaker was uh, a permaculture person and I was a little um, unsettled by the presentation because it really put biochar in the alternative category and I was definitely wanting to make it um, more mainstream than that. I should say that uh, the reason, the trigger that started our interest in biochar was a little old man who hunchback shuffled into the office and this 80 year old with a 200 year plan for his carry woodlot said we need a gasification system here. We need to be this, this and this. We should be doing stuff on biochar. And it was the only person I had heard in my area speak about biochar. So I thought, well, there's two of us now, so we can actually start something. So the first speaker presented information um, and was selling market garden um, pots of biochar at market garden prices and that scared the daylights out of our farmers when they were extrapolating to what it would cost per tons per hectare. The second speaker we had was um, Sid Shea, who was one of the early members of the Rainbow Bee the team, and Peter Burgess is going to be talking about what their more recent developments are. And Sid Shea described a little bit of the early trials that were happening in the wheat belt in Western Australia probably the most hostile environment in which to trial the benefits of biochar. And I believe at that time, a lot of misassumptions were made about biochar, biochar's capacity. And of course, when it didn't produce more than 10% yield increases, then 
it um, it wasn't pursued with the rigour that it should have been. But Sib described a model where a community could produce its own energy, it could generate its own um, energy independence, but through that employment. So it was a really energy, uh, a community building um, proposition, which is why I think that what you're doing here is really a tremendous scheme too. So that particular night, Doug Powell went home and thought, how can I get biochar into my soil when I don't have the enormous machinery of broadacre farmers. The um, air seeders wouldn't fit through the gates in our farms in the southwest, where we're more intensive agriculture. Now, Doug was a dung beetle enthusiast. He had uh, deliberately sourced beetles that were available, not on his property, and introduced them. And I should say at this point, these dung beetles are largely from Europe. Uh, the dung beetles that we have naturally in Australia do not uh, have a preference for ruminant manure. And so in the 1950s, when I was growing up, paddocks would be covered in dung that was just lying on the surface. Blowflies would be everywhere. You couldn't have a picnic. There was no outside dining. And so it was a Hungarian, actually, who came up with the scheme of importing dung beetles into Australia. And over um, a 40 plus year period, about 50 species were imported and 23 of those have established. Um, not enough, we've reactivated the program so that we, we can get more in the southwest because we only have seven species in our area. And dung beetles um, don't operate all year round. Different species have different seasonal applications. So Doug knew a lot about dung beetles. So what he contemplated was utilising dung beetles as a biological mechanism for getting the biochar into the ground. If he was to feed his cattle the biochar, the dung beetles could bury it. So we saw a little bit of uh, information from people who knew what they were talking about. Arkin Gerlach is one study that we have relied on significantly. <clears throat> and a lot of these benefits of using um, biochar in cattle have been discussed already. But the second one, which is a point I raised earlier about the uh, gastroenteric parasites, it is a critical issue in Australia um, in livestock production. <coughs> the fact that our king also had local farmers involved in the trial was very useful for us because when you're talking to farmers, they tend to believe farmers more than they believe the scientists. I was a little concerned though on this um, four week study where they talked about reduced mortality rates because we don't really want animals to die in a four week period. The study was based on housed cattle, whereas our livestock are free ranging. So there are some variations there. We couldn't rely on that completely. <coughs> Excuse me, I just, uh, you generously gave me an Austrian bug. So we sought um, confirmation from an entomologist that the biochar itself was unlikely to do damage to the dung beetles. Now adult dung beetles slurp the juice from the manure and the tunnelling variety, which is the one we were looking at now, Bubis bison, it builds tunnels and buries, packs the fibrous manure down to depths of about 60 centimetres. <coughs> in suitable loam soils. Thanks, Peter. <coughs> so the advice was, it's unlikely to do any damage, so give it a go. Now, the, the biochar that we're using is sourced from Simcoa, which is an alumina smelting operation. It's an Australian native hardwood. Um, high temperature pyrolysis. 
Thank you very much. <clears throat> Initially, molasses was used as an enticement and to bind it together um, somewhat. The rate that I can suggest it was 300 grams per animal. And this is where the scientists here are going to be freaking out because there's nothing scientific about this application rate. Because the animals themselves self-regulate. Mix is, uh, according to what the herd size was, it's uh, prepared with molasses and placed into cut off 44 gallon drums, <clears throat> what is that, 100 litres? <clears throat> and you can see there, there's a certain attraction. Um, they lick their lips, they move away, and somebody else comes in to have a go. And the cows teach their calves how to take it up as well. Now, when I did this on my property, um, and I was leasing it to a neighbour, so they weren't my cows. And the boss cow stood there and ate and ate and ate. <laughs> and I was a little bit nervous about what I was going to be doing, whether my lease payment might be deducted. Pretty satisfied. So the dung beetles, um, and there was a mention made about the size of the particles for the cattle feed. The, part, the biochar that we source is between two and five mil. It's the fines from the, um, from the processor. And so the large particles go through the cow and come out as fine particles. So the digestion process reduces the size of those particles. The question was, would the dung beetles bury the biochar as well as the manure? And the answer most certainly is yes. What's interesting is dung beetles have an olfactory system. They, they're guided by the smell of the manure. But it's very noticeable that the cow manure of cow that's consumed biochar does not smell. And yet the beetles still manage to find it very efficiently. We've had several field days and attracted interest of farmers. When you get farmers' interest, um, then you are on a winner. So some simple mini pit trials. Digging beneath a dung pad, <clears throat> you can see there the, um, the tail of the buried manure. That was down to 40 centimetres, that particular one. And as a result of this buried char and manure, we see a proliferation of fungal activity, an increase in clover production, which is an issue in Australia at the moment, the, um, the demise of clover in our pastures. Now, when Doug was giving a presentation um, in the Eastern States, uh, Professor Stephen Joseph heard about it and was quite intrigued by this mechanism this biological no-input, virtually, mechanism for carbon sequestration. And so we arranged to have some soil sampling done. Well, actually, Doug was on holidays overseas, so Muggins was the one who was doing the soil sampling. So we were choosing um, soil that was around the char tunnel. So it wasn't in the manure itself. It was soil that was um, on the edges of the tunnel and compared to soil that was um, underneath a, um, a, a paddock fence because there were livestock in this paddock. So if you wanted to have an area of, of the natural soil that's not likely to have had manure buried there already, then you had to go where the cows don't go. And electric fences hopefully keep them out of that patch. So you can see on these test results that where biochar has been buried, it has significant difference in the levels of nutrient availability. And interestingly, the ratios of those nutrients. 
Um, you'll notice that um, zinc, lead, what was the other one? Copper. So some of the heavy metals there are less. <coughs> so from Doug's point of view, he's saying that for him, the animals are healthy, um, and the livestock carrier that comes along to to, um, to ferry them to market, who also has a property of his own and goes to various other properties, remarks, how come your paddocks are still green? How come your animals are in this condition when you're not feeding them supplementary hay? So from what Doug is saying, that his input costs have reduced significantly. So he's not necessarily producing more kilograms of meat from that farm, but he's far, far more profitable. <coughs> so Steve and Joseph assembled a cast of thousands, including some here, and we collectively wrote up a, a paper based on this. So it's not scientific. These are what we're hoping to do in the work that we do at the, at the grassroots level is to stimulate interest that those with the resources and the expertise can follow up and, and give us some more accurate answers. But as you can see, Stephen came up with a whole set of, um, of conclusions here that's all good news to a farmer. And those of you who know him, he's very keen on, on using his specky technology. And I'm not going to go through that, so this is all in that paper that you can access. <coughs> so bar chart that goes through the cow is, uh, is activated. We tried to secure some interest from the Meat and Livestock Australia Corporation, which is our leading livestock national um, group, funded by levies from farmers and then sponsored by the government to undertake some rumen trials um, and met with failure at the numerous steps. However, after the Canadian um, trial was announced, uh, we've got two researchers now who've been invited to submit a full proposal uh, that will complement the work that's being done in Canada. I would really like them to include biochar to cattle to dung beetles in that equation. That, that's a connection that needs further exploration. So we know this biological tool is only one part of building a healthy soil profile. And so biochar is not considered a silver bullet. It's just one strategy to assist in building a healthy, fertile, productive soil. Okay, it's telling me something here I don't want to know about. Um, I think it's something to do with, do you want to restart or? Morgan? Thank you. <laughs> I did learn German for two years, but they didn't, um, we didn't have computers in those days. <laughs> now this, um, what Doug was doing was a personal exploration. And what we decided was, we need to develop this a little bit further. Um, can we take this to a greenfield site and see if we introduce dung beetles to that area, if, if we introduce biochar, is it commercially viable? And we approached a large dairy um, proprietor, 1,000 head dairy. We knew this site didn't have dung beetles on it um, and it had very low acid soil. So it was really a candidate for having soil improvement. Bannister Downs Dairy is now uh, linked to Gina Reinhardt, who is, um, some of you may know, rather a wealthy individual from the resource sector. 
So we're a bit hopeful there. One thing I was concerned about and tried to convey to this dairy farmer that Baito was dirty and a commercial dairy needs to be clean. So how was he going to be able to manage the biochar in appropriate measured doses to his animals? He said, no problem, I've got a technician who can work on that. It took him a few months, but eventually they did. Uh, fortunately, he was really fascinated in uh, the dung beetle story. And although this was just a very short-term trial, you can't get appreciable or measurable results of dung beetle activity from, from uh, 2,000 beetles on a 10 hectare paddock in two years. So that was just ridiculous. What we really wanted to know was, can this be done on a commercial situation? Was it workable? And the answer was definitely yes. Um, one obvious result here where you can see the bioturbation of where dung beetles are and where the steam manure is just lying on the surface. So when you can bring up subsoil with all those leach nutrients, you are increasing the, the fertility of that topsoil layer. Uh, more beetles we want to raise and getting the farmer enthusiasm Okay, so Kathleen asked me to give a bit of an update on what the livestock situation was in Australia. Now, as that map of Australia indicated, Western Australia is a little bit like Serbia. It's 50 years behind the east of Australia. And um, some of the, um, the practices that are regenerative agricultural practices that are now becoming more commonplace it's been hard work in the last 10 years to introduce into southwest Western Australia. It's a very conservative farming area. Um, but I, I saw, and also people who are doing um, anything that might be termed alternative are fairly reluctant to be public about it. They're reticent to talk about what it is that they're doing. So, I um, stalk Facebook a fair bit on soil webs, uh, Facebook pages and I came across this chap from New England which is on the East Coast. He practices holistic management and he sent me a couple of photos that are showing the difference between what happens using holistic management on his property compared to his neighbour. The very faulty photo on the left there um, is in a period of drought, but you can still see that he still has green pasture. As was mentioned earlier, you need continuous growing, but continuous green. Interestingly, he also told me that he and 11 other properties that were utilising holistic management type behaviour, practices, um, were considered outliers in this study. And so their data wasn't recorded when they were calculating what the organic matter levels were uh, in the soil of their region. So why I approached this man was because he was using, starting to use biochar and zeolite. Now very recently David Tomlinson um, gave a webinar um, where he was discussing the synergies between biochar and, and um, zeolite, and I'll show that in a moment. That's from the Australian New Zealand Biochar Institute, that webinar. So what um, Richard was thinking was that already, and he was having the biochar and the zeolite and mixing it together with the lasses, so it wasn't co-paralysis uh, paralysis with um, the two items. Then he felt that the animal's performance... Uh, when I talk about animal performance as well, I'll go back to the dairy farmer. Dairy Australia have annual awards. And if you recall, our Kim Gulak's study said that there was increased butter fat um, in the milk of the dairy, the dairy herd in that study. Bannister Downs won Dairy Australia's Cream Award the year that he was using biochar. However, he said he's always looking for improvement 
Um, so there are other variables in the mix, and he couldn't say that was the cause. But he was continuing to use it, so there's a pretty good indication that he felt there might be some substance to it. So what Richard's thinking that with now his experience in his increased um, carbon levels with holistic management, that there will be a compounding improvement in his pasture production and all those other factors. And here's um, David Tomlinson, this whole stack there, uh, <clears throat> I'm sure he's published. He, he's from um, Castle Mountain Zeolite, so obviously this is a commercial push, but many of you will be aware of the properties of Zeolite and recognise that there are synergies there. And whether the two together may provide some um, trace minerals as well as uh, additional biochar properties for all those other benefits we talked about before. Uh, Olsen uh, um, is another company that's difficult to get straight answers from. Um, they are now selling this product in Western Australia, but the, um, the people I approach couldn't tell me um, how much has been sold, so I'm assuming they haven't sold much at all. Um, $40 a block for an 18 kilo block, I think for a commercial farmer might, might be thinking, I'll only use that for a sick animal or, or something of that nature. But it will be interesting to follow that and see how well it progresses. And there was one other thing I was going to say, but I've forgotten. So, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you.